I've been waiting so many moons for these benchmarks. I'm so excited they're finally here. AMD has been waiting for so many moons to tell Intel to go away. And Nvidia runs better when you don't use Nvidia. Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news that I can find on the internet while you enjoy your Monday breakfast. What follows is a brief Sneezing. Montage. <laughs> Stupid allergies. <laughs> I'd like to be done sneezing now, body. <laughs> no more sneezing fits. Let's start off with talking about the numbers that I've been waiting for, Mason. All right, you ready for Intel's GPU finally getting some benchmarks and some leaked numbers getting out there on the internet. This time we're getting numbers from Geekbench of the high flagship version, the 512 execution unit version that we're waiting on to come out. We have its OpenCL performance score and it runs roughly at the around 66 to 69,000 points mark, which might sound impressive, might sound nice even, until you start comparing it to other GPUs like Nvidia's RTX 2060. This is Intel's flagship GPU, which mind you, the price we're expecting on this one is roughly eight to $900, which that doesn't seem up to snuff now, does it? Well, there's some good explanation for it. While we're expecting this GPU to run at up to two point one gigahertz as it discloses here in the max clock frequency during the benchmarking test it only ran at 1329 so this does seem to be an early sample production that's not ready to run at full speeds or the max turbo frequency that the gpu can enable but based on those calculations if it's running at 69,000 points at 1.3 gigahertz if it can scale up to 2.1 gigahertz we're looking at roughly a 6800 level in performance obviously the price would have to be well below what a 6800 is to get you to jump ship over to Team Blue, but it does look like if they can figure out clock speed, we might have a healthy competitor on our hands. And I'm just gonna anxiously anticipate more benchmarks as we get closer to the launch of Intel's upcoming Alchemist GPU. Let me know what you think of the Alchemist performance numbers down below in the comments while I reach down below to pick up today's video sponsor. Yeah, that's right. We're talking about Drop and their PC37X headset, which is is on a very generous sale for this holiday shopping season. My friends, I've had this headset for over two years at this point, and I absolutely love it because it's part of Drop's partnership with Sennheiser, so you get ridiculously good audio quality in here, but it also has a killer mic. My kids have actually been using the PC37X and 38X for their remote schooling ever since we went virtual, and they consistently have the best microphone out of their class bar none, all right? And they're just using a gaming headset Headset. It's amazing. It, I know that it's like kind of weird to take pride in this kind of stuff with your kids, but my kids always in class, I listen over the headphones here and what all the other kids sound like. None of them have the audio quality that the PC37X does. And it's only going for $95 right now during their special. And they're great for plenty of other reasons, including the fact that they have a sleek design, which makes it so that my wife is actually using a pair right now for a business meeting that she conducts. It gets her good audio quality, but it doesn't look like a gamer headset. It also has the noise canceling mic, but when you flip it up, it then goes into mute. Also, it has a detachable and replaceable cable, which is just tremendous value. You break the cable as people are wont to do, and you can just order a new cable. You don't have to go out and order an entirely new headset. If you're looking for a gaming headset this holiday shopping season or know somebody who would appreciate one, $95 gets you some really good audio quality, really good microphone quality, and you're gonna be on your way to greatness with these. So check them out at the link in the video description. Big thanks to Drop for sponsoring sponsoring today's episode of Hot News. Now let's talk about somebody trying to drop somebody else, and that's AMD trying to get rid of Intel in their stacks. They're finally rolling out their MediaTek branded internet kit, which is something we talked about in previous episodes of Hot News, that AMD, one of the things that they're lacking when it comes to their laptop and full stack production for hardware is the fact that they typically have to rely on Intel to produce something like a Wi-Fi chip in order for their motherboards or their laptops to ship with no longer. AMD now launching their Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6 RZ660 controller based on their partnership with MediaTek, which will allow them to get Wi-Fi 6E as well as Bluetooth 5.2. And so now AMD can continue the march forward of getting Intel out of their way, out of their life, and never, ever, ever, ever getting back to
together. And a lot of people will never ever ever use a game that uses de nouveau DRM specifically because it penalizes people who actually pay for the version of the game, whereas people who have played cracked versions don't have to deal with any of the performance issues that exist or like the issues that are happening with Alder Lake right now, the ability to not even really play the game because it doesn't know how to deal with the heterogeneous architecture. Anyways, Gigabytes fixing that for you if you have one of Gigabytes new Z690 motherboards, instead of having to go into the BIOS and disable the E cores, which is part of the issue of why the DRM's having problems, they have a DRM fix tool, which you can load in your operating system and actually turn off the E cores on the fly and then turn them back on when you're done, which is actually a really great solution to a problem that neither Intel nor Microsoft could think about before these things launched. You built your own scheduler for Alder Lake into Windows 11, and yet you were like, nah, e-cores are gonna be fine, okay? Everything's everything's gonna work great. Anyways, it's like a less than a meg download for you to get this in case you have Gigabyte Z690 motherboards. We'll leave links for that down below in the description. And now down below is what we're talking about with the crypto stonks. Let's look at the numbers. Bitcoin down 2% on the day to sit at around $58,000. Still under that $60,000 mark over the last week it has had a rough little trajectory ethereum also down 3.5 percent to be at 42.41 and dogecoin also down three percent to be at 22 cents but that is the opposite of what happened with the meme stonks gamestop on friday Pwah! up 8.89 percent to sit at 228.80 it's just been it's on a been on a rip tear look at gamestop being all high and mighty over it's like last month being higher 233.60 is the highest points reached in the last month but closing friday 228 80. Game C not having as big of a day, but closing up 1.1% on Friday to be at 4087. But let's talk about something that could potentially impact new stock IPO for Rivian, and that is Ford and Rivian announcing that they are no longer going to be jointly developing an EV. This is despite the fact that Ford made a $500 million investment in Rivian back in 2019. Originally, it was supposed to be a Lincoln branded EV that got kiboshed, and then they said that they're going to work on some undisclosed project with Ford and now that is no longer existent either Ford and Rivian amicably parting ways although that 500 million dollar investment that Ford made into Rivian I believe I might be wrong on that number but I think it's worth roughly 13 or 130 billion there's a there's a zero in there somewhere I think but it's worth a lot more than Ford put into it just by the fact that the IPO for Rivian was super successful and one of the reasons this might be the case is Ford has been seeing tremendous success when it comes to their Ford F-150 Lightning program, or at least with the reservations for the upcoming electric pickup truck that we're expecting them to debut sometime next year. And what we found out is that the 150,000 res reservations that they have for the F-150 Lightning does not include fleet pre-orders. This is just like random people off the street. So it's a really great reservation number. It's approaching 200,000. That's more than they're gonna be able to produce in the first three years, according to them. And so they're actually seeing those sell out. But it doesn't include the Ford Pro program, which is like their fleet customers. So how many are they actually gonna have to make? Anyways, showing that Ford doesn't need Rivian and the partnership between the two companies happened at a time where they were both less certain of what their futures were going to be like Ford not ha yet having the Mach-E released and Rivian not having their huge rollout for Amazon delivery vehicles, them not having the R1T being rolling off the production lines and them also not having an IPO, which they did with a spec. So it's a completely different world now in 2021 between Ford and Rivian. Ford made their money. Rivian still looks like they're going to be doing pretty okay. I, it always made like it was kind of weird that Ford partnered up with them, in my opinion, simply because like Ford, you're you're doing your own EV thing. Why are you like investing in a competitor? It kind of feels like they just threw money at it to like be like, we just want somebody to not be Tesla and win. If it's gonna be, if it's not gonna be us, it has to be not Tesla. And DuckDuckGo is saying, I don't want not anybody tracking you, okay? The DuckDuckGo app on Android is now gonna block other apps from tracking you. This is gonna be something that's inbuilt in the DuckDuckGo app on there, and it, you can have app tracking protection, which it'll then show you which apps have been trying to track you the most. This is not quite like Apple's app tracking transparency feature, which gives you the choice to opt out of data tracking within the apps, but rather it's gonna be external and apply 
to a lot more with DuckDuckGo saying that they're gonna continually work to identify and protect against new trackers, even if companies are trying to subvert this in case you want privacy on your Android phone, this might be the way to go. And Samsung's way to go is forward to the future. They're, 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 they're announcing. They recently announced DDR6 at their Samsung Tech Day, which uh, we just had DDR5, but showing that it can run at up to 17,000 megabits per second compared to two DDR5's current 8,500. So roughly double what we're seeing from DDR5 at the current moment. Them also talking about GDDR7 and 6 Plus production, which could come out to GPUs and help with memory bandwidth and the like. Not a ton of ETA is gonna be next year into the future. DDR5 obviously gonna take a while to adopt. DDR6 likely gonna be taking a while to adopt as well. So don't necessarily quote this as coming to a PC near you, but just something to get excited for, which something that I think it's it's a complaint that I do hear a lot, especially when it comes to like PCI Express 5.0. Why do we need PCI Express 5.0 when we don't even saturate 3.0? Because you want the standards ahead of where you're actually using the technology. As long as the standards continue to outpace the data throughput that you have, you don't have that as a bottleneck. Standards being ahead of what you actually use is a good thing. I'd rather have PCI Express 7.0 right now and we're nowhere like we're at like one tenth of the maximum use case. That would be great because then that means we could focus on other bottlenecks or something like HDMI 2.0, which was holding back from like true 4K 144 Hertz displays. We needed HDMI 2.1 to come out. It's happened recently that a standard was limiting what you could actually use depending on the devices that you had. And Nvidia no longer wants to limit themselves to just being on PCs or MacBooks or Chromebooks or anything like that. GeForce now announcing their partnership with LG to bring cloud gaming to WebOS smart TVs. I think this is just the obvious play, the smartest play that they could potentially be making. And Samsung's announced that they're working on their own cloud gaming thing, which obviously would then go on their TVs. But it, I just this is where you would want cloud gaming to be built into something that doesn't have the possibility of being able to play stuff. Sure, I, now it can load up anything I want. Oh my gosh, dang TV without having to buy an expensive extra device, considering the fact that I just bought a freaking $2,000 OLED TV. I want some gaming potentiality built into it. This makes a lot of sense, as long as they don't cap your frame rates like they've been doing you, which is a pretty scummy move by Nvidia. So, you know, use it if you want, but you could also not use Nvidia's own OpenGL drivers when it comes to performing video games. Somebody developing their own Nvidia Vulkan driver to run games that normally run on Nvidia's OpenGL driver, but then finding that when you enable this custom Vulkan one, you get better frame rate. You're going from 121 FPS in the original Tomb Raider reboot to 151, which is insane. Obviously, that's a massive performance jump for just changing the driver stack that you're using. However, the developers of this saying that don't expect this in every use case. It's that's likely not what it's going to be. Just that it's a neat little uh, byproduct of some inefficiencies in Nvidia's OpenGL drivers. And this has been a mightily inefficient episode of Hot News. I spent the first 10 minutes of it sneezing up a storm. So I'm gonna go rest and recover from my allergies and I'll see you tomorrow for another episode of Breakfast with Brett. This is what we call these things now. Hot news tomorrow, bye. Hot news. <laughs>